Good morning. It's July 13th. It's about 9.05 in the morning. And I am going to go over this uh, sectional conflict lecture with you. And this is really just kind of what's going on before the Civil War happens and how we get to that point. <clears throat> you got to look at 1846. And I know that's probably confusing what this has to do with the Civil War. But in 1846, the Mexican-American War has just ended, and the United States has gotten a lot of new territory. And the biggest question about this new territory is whether it's going to have slaves or not. And the Wilmot Proviso uh, was a suggestion that was presented in Congress. And it said that all of the territory that was gained from Mexico should be slave-free. Um, the southern states absolutely did not want that, and this ended up being rejected. But we also have the Whig Party being split into two parts because of this. Uh, the Whigs were a national party. They weren't a sectional party. So some of the Whigs were pro-slavery. Some of the Whigs were anti-slavery. And when slavery becomes the number one question the country has to deal with following the Mexican-American War, that Whig Party is going to start to fall apart. And it's going to lead to this idea of popular sovereignty. Uh, the easiest way to explain this is everybody's going to get to vote whether they want slaves or not. Uh, this would be for new territories. This would be for that land that was gained from Mexico. Uh, when the Wilmot Proviso doesn't work, uh, some of the politicians say, well, let's just let the people vote. I mean, what's more American than that than letting people choose you know, what they want through the ballot box. And it's actually going to make things much, much worse than anybody thought. Um, so when we get into 1850, uh, the anti-slavery movement is becoming radical and violent. Uh, there are new political parties. Uh, the Free Soil Party is going on, uh, which was an anti-slavery party. You've got the Know Nothing Party I mentioned in the last video, which is anti-immigration. And slavery and the debate over it is the number one topic everybody talks about in the 1850s. Manifest destiny, that whole idea is pretty much gone. So in 1848, uh, we've got three major political uh, aspirations going on. Um, Lewis Cass is going to be a Democrat who is running for president. You've got Zachary Taylor, who is a Whig running for president. And then we have good old Martin Van Buren, the same guy that we talked about with, um, <clears throat> excuse me, with Andrew Jackson way back in the 1820s, 1830s. He is back again to run for president. Now, Lewis Cass, he's all about popular sovereignty. He wants people to choose and vote. Do you want slavery or not? Uh, Zachary Taylor, uh, he is a slave owner from, I believe, Louisiana. And he just completely ignores the, the problem and says, hey, I'm a war hero, vote for us. And then Martin Van Buren is the only one who is openly against slavery. Now, if you look at these numbers, they're pretty close when you look at the popular vote and the electoral college vote. But also pay attention that this first time party, uh, the Free Soil Party, uh, they get almost 300,000 votes. So that shows you that there's a good number of people who either question slavery or don't want slavery. Another thing that's going to happen is California gains enough population that it can apply for statehood. Um, gold is discovered in 1848, 1849, the gold rush happens, and by 1850 there are so many people living in California that it applies for statehood. And in California they go anti-slavery. Uh, it's not because they really, you know, were anti-slavery. They were anti-anybody taking my gold. So slavery is going to be opposed because they didn't want a bunch of people to come in there and try to, you know, steal gold. So Henry Clay, the same one who, come up, who comes up with the uh, Missouri Compromise of 1820 or whatever it was, and uh, the first American system after the War of 1812, he is still around. Uh, he's very old by this point. And he comes up with a new compromise. He says, okay, we're going to let California come in as a free state. 
but we're going to create a new territory, the territory of New Mexico, and that one might be slave. We'll let the people of New Mexico vote on whether they want to be a slave territory or a free territory. And then we will abolish slavery in Washington, D.C. So both sides are getting something. Uh, the most controversial thing about Henry Clay's compromise here in 1815 is the Fugitive Slave Act. Uh, the Fugitive Slave Act is going to give people the power and permission to um, hunt down former slaves or current slaves or anybody that looks like they might be a slave. So there are going to be people all over the country who can be put back into slavery. And really, more than anything else, the Fugitive Slave Act is going to... Uh, bring slavery to everybody's front door. And there are a lot of people that have problems with the Fugitive Slave Act and how much it strengthens the protections about slavery. Now, when it comes down to it, nobody is actually happy with this. The South feels like they've given up a bunch of territory where there could be slavery. The North feels like they've opened up a bunch of territory to where there could be slavery. And then the North also, you know, they really don't like the idea of, you know, slavery going everywhere. So this really, this compromise of 1850, in a lot of ways, makes everything worse. Uh, another place you have to look at is Kansas. Um, by the 1840s, the t combined territory of Kansas and Nebraska, they have enough population where uh, they need to be separated into two parts. And so the Kansas-Nebraska Act is going to create two new territories, the territory of Kansas, the territory of Nebraska. They're going to be organized with an official government. And uh, Kansas has to decide, are we going to be a slave territory or a free territory? Now, this should theoretically already have been solved because Kansas and Nebraska, they're both north of Missouri. The Missouri Compromise Line back in 1820 banned slavery from being north of Missouri. So we're done. Why, why is this even a question? It's because southern congressmen and southern senators push for slavery to be considered in those two places and they conveniently had a way to do this through popular sovereignty uh, popular sovereignty is also going to be a big deal for a guy named stephen douglas stephen douglas is a senator from illinois he's like the number one champion of popular sovereignty. He wants people to vote for everything, which makes sense if you're democratic. But it causes a problem in Kansas because when popular sovereignty is announced, when it's made known that Kansas will be able to vote for slavery or no slavery, people from both sides start to flood the Missouri or from the Missouri Territory into the Kansas Territory. In fact, in Kansas, the Missouri laws are going to be adopted into Kansas before they even decide if they're going to be slave or free. So the Missouri Slave Code is going to be used as the official laws of Kansas. And you're like, wait a minute, they're supposed to vote whether they want slaves or not. Well, they've already okayed it before that vote even happens. There are laws passed that make it illegal to speak against slavery, write against slavery, an anti-slavery government is going to form. So Kansas ends up having not one but two uh, governments in their territory and fighting breaks out. Uh, John Brown, who is going to be uh, in trouble for you know, trying to start a, a riot or a, an uprising in Virginia in a couple of years, he leads an attack at a place called Potawatomi Creek where he and his sons kill some people. And even in Washington, D.C., uh, in, in the Capitol building, uh, there's a senator named Charles Sumner who's giving an anti-slavery speech, and he's going to be attacked by somebody from South Carolina named Preston Brooks. And uh, Preston Brooks actually knocks Senator Sumner unconscious and breaks his skull open. In 1857, uh, Kansas votes for a constitution, but there are only two choices. You can have full slavery or limited slavery. There is no anti-slavery option. And so there's problems with that vote. 
Uh, second vote is done to reject the first vote, and then a third vote is done to uh, do an anti-slavery constitution. The pro-slavery people don't want that. And so Kansas turns into a huge mess. It doesn't become a state until 1861 because it was blocked by alternating sides. So Kansas is a mess and because of the bloodshed there, it's known as Bleeding Kansas. Now, when we get to 1860, this is going to be when slavery becomes the number one issue uh, in politics. And we're going to get a new, a new political party. Let me move this here so you can see that fine looking guy there. Uh, we get um, the Know Nothing Party, which is the anti-Catholic, anti-immigration party. And then we get the Free Soil Party, which is the anti-slavery party. And then we get radical abolitionists together. Those three groups join and they create what is today's Republican Party. So you've got anti-slaves, anti-immigration, anti-Catholic, anti-everything pretty much. And John C. Fremont, who is famous for creating the California Trail, he becomes their first presidential nominee. The sitting president, Millard Fillmore, he runs for re-election with the Whig Party. And then James Buchanan, who is this guy here, he's going to be the Democratic candidate. Um, Millard Fillmore has one of the worst defeats for a sitting president in history. He only gets eight electoral college votes. If I remember correctly, he doesn't even win his own state. Uh, John C. Fremont, the first time that you know a Republican nominee exists because the Republican Party is brand new. Look at that. They get 114 electoral college votes and a full 33% of the popular vote. All right, so what happens with uh, James Buchanan here? Buchanan, he tries to just ignore slavery until he can't. And the reason he can't is because of the Dred Scott case. Uh, this guy right here, that's Dred Scott, if you've never seen him before. Uh, to make the story pretty easy to understand, Dred Scott was born in 1799. Uh, he was born into slavery, and he was sold to a military doctor who was based out of uh, St. Louis. During his ownership by this military doctor, he went to places such as Wisconsin and Illinois, the Minnesota Territory, places where slavery was technically outlawed, but he is kept as a slave and he is going to become basically a, a military surgeon's assistant. When the military surgeon dies, uh, Dred Scott is in, in a territory where slavery is prohibited and he claims that he's free when his master dies in a slave-free state. Uh, the wife of the owner disagrees and sells Dred Scott and his family and then Dred Scott's able to get some lawyers to challenge this. And it makes its way all the way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court, when it gets to that point, that's when James Buchanan comes out and says, you know, you have to support slavery. Slavery is one of the things that this country is founded on. And ultimately, the Supreme Court does rule that Dred Scott and his family are still slaves. The biggest two things of that ruling, number one, uh, they say no African American, whether slave or free, could ever be considered citizen since the Founding Fathers could not have intended such a result. The Supreme Court says that African Americans cannot be American citizens. So any black person who had citizenship, it was taken away. The other thing is it meant that slavery was further expanded because Dred Scott, his master died in a slave, slave free state. And even though he was claiming to be free because he's in a slave free state, the Supreme Court says, no, once a slave, always a slave. As a result of this Dred Scott uh, case, John Brown that I just talked about leads a raid on a military installation in Harper's Ferry, Virginia, and tries to start a slave revolt. Uh, he's going to be rounded up, ironically, by uh, Robert E. Lee, who was at that point a member of the U.S. Army. All right, Lincoln, um, he's going to run for president in 1860, and he has just recently become a big name. Uh, he was born in Kentucky in 1809. His mother dies at a young age. By 1830, he lives in Illinois in a place called Salem. Uh, 
Uh, he's a riverboat captain. He volunteers for the Black Hawk War. Um, and he is going to be an, a politician in the Illinois state government. He runs as a Whig in 1832, but he loses. He wins in 1834. He serves there till 1842, and then he says, you know what, my job is done. Uh, in 1837, he moves to Springfield, Illinois, into this house right here, which, by the way, you can actually tour. Uh, the state of Illinois and the national government have saved a couple city blocks of old Springfield. And Springfield, by the way, it's very pretty. You should visit. Um, <clears throat> by the time we get to 1858... He's going to run for U.S. Senate against Stephen Douglas. And uh, there's a picture of Stephen Douglas with a beardless Abraham Lincoln. And very famously, they have the Lincoln-Douglas debates. It's a series of seven debates that happen throughout Illinois. There's one debate for each of their congressional districts. And during these debates, Lincoln is going to very famously say that the country cannot survive half slave and half free. And Douglas is going to support popular sovereignty, the idea that people should be able to vote and choose. Now, Lincoln is interesting. Lincoln personally did not like slavery. He did not believe in slavery, but he also did not believe in racial equality either, which surprises a lot of people because Lincoln is seen as the, uh, the great emancipator. Uh, Lincoln in 1860 had no plans on, on doing anything about racial equality. He just wants slavery to end. Uh, however, Lincoln also was a constitutional lawyer, and he knew that slavery could not be ended without a con constitutional uh, amendment. Uh, ultimately, Lincoln does lose this 1858 Senate campaign, but through his speeches, he becomes a household name, and through his speeches, he becomes the number one proponent of the anti-slavery movement. So in 1860, we end up with four different candidates. Abraham Lincoln is a member of the Free Soil Party. Uh, he's not officially a member of the Republican Party, but he is going to be nominated by the Republicans. Uh, on paper, Abraham Lincoln is a member of the Free Soil Party. He's anti-slavery, but he's a constitutional lawyer. He's anti-Native American. Uh, Stephen Douglas is going to be the Northern Democrat. Uh, the Democratic Party meets and they have their their um, meeting where they choose who their presidential nominee is going to be. Uh, they choose Stephen Douglas, but Southern Democrats walk out and they split the party. Uh, Stephen Douglas, he wants popular sovereignty. Uh, he's not explicitly against slavery. He doesn't like it personally, but he is going to let the people choose. Uh, when the Southern Democrats move out of the meeting, they have their own meeting and they choose John Breckinridge. And John Breckinridge was James Buchanan's vice president. He was from Tennessee, I believe. And um, he was an extreme supporter of slavery. Then last but not least is John Bell. Uh, this is a one and done party, the Constitutional Union Party. Basically, let's not talk about slavery and let's keep the union together. Let's just kick the can down the road and see if we can come up with a solution. Now it's no, it's no secret that Abraham Lincoln wins, but it, just in case you've never actually seen the numbers, here they are. Breckinridge, who is the vice president, gets 850,000 votes. John Bell is the Constitution Constitutional Union. He gets about 600,000 votes. Abraham Lincoln gets 1.9 million votes, and then Stephen Douglas gets 1.4 million votes. So the popular votes are pretty close between Lincoln and Douglas. But when you look at the Electoral College votes, 180 for Lincoln, only 12 for Douglas. And if this was a face-to-face -face class, I would ask you, you know, why does Douglas only have 12 Electoral College votes but 1.4 million votes? But you know, since it's a web class, can't really do that. So I'll just give you the answer. Stephen Douglas was the second choice for everybody. He was the, the second best option for everybody. Whether you want slavery or not, he was the second best. So um, he got a lot of votes everywhere, but he was never really the majority vote. So he didn't get any of the Electoral College. Now, Lincoln's first inaugural address, he, he basically says, um, you know, if you don't do anything to us, we won't do anything to you. Well, 
everybody knows that this is kind of like a tipping point. And Senator John Crittenden of Kentucky, he tries to do a last minute compromise. And he says, okay, let's roll the clock back to 1820. We'll take that Missouri Compromise line seriously, and we will exist as a half-free, half-slave country. Uh, the Southern congressmen say, yeah, we can, we can deal with that. But the Northern congressmen, they're like, no, this is the beginning of the end for slavery. South Carolina is going to leave the country December 20th, 1860. Lincoln's not president at that point. Point in time. Lincoln doesn't become president until March 4th of 1861. That means that South Carolina leaves the Union and the Confederacy is created while President James Buchanan is president. And James Buchanan, because he just lets the Union disintegrate without doing anything, is one of the lower ranked presidents of American history now. After Lincoln wins, uh, there are votes taken throughout the South, and South Carolina, Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, and Texas are all going to leave the Union before February 1st, 1861. So all of those states leave the Union before Lincoln is president. And during this entire time, Lincoln is saying, okay, don't do anything hasty, calm down a little bit. Slavery is protected in the Supreme Court, slavery is protected in the Constitution. I can't end slavery. But these southern states, they don't care. Uh, a government's going to be formed. Um, the Confederate government is going to be created in eight days. They take the U.S. Constitution, they cross out a couple of words, they add a couple of things, and there you go. That That's going to be the Confederate Constitution. Jefferson Davis, who's a senator from Mississippi, is going to become president. And Alexander Stevens, who is actually from Georgia, will become the vice president. Uh, when Jefferson Davis is elected president, he gives a speech in the Senate, he resigns, and he goes to uh, form this government. Alexander Stevens, he was actually against Georgia leaving the Union, but he was called on by his people to lead, and so he leaves Congress as well and becomes the vice president. So, you know, the path to the Civil War was pretty complicated and it took you know more than a decade really it took 20 or 30 years to get this point but really by 1858 there was little to, that could have stopped this from happening um, personal opinion James Buchanan is the one who would have had to stop it uh, when he didn't uh, Lincoln there was nothing he could do all right so that is going to be your look at the sectional crisis and how the country really falls apart in that 10-year period before the Civil War. And um, we'll talk to you soon. See you later. Bye-bye.